Hello and welcome to the second episode of On the Waters, our brand new podcast about religion, theology, and world myth. We're your hosts, I'm Jordan. And I'm Livnant. And today we're continuing our discussion about the creation narrative in Genesis. We're going to be covering verses 1, 14 through 2, 3, just so that you can keep track at home. And we're going to be continuing our analysis of the traditional days of the week in Judaism and their significance in Genesis as it's set forth in the first and second chapter. And we're going to be talking about that chapter division that occurs at the end. Why is the seventh day separated from the rest in yes. most written forms of the Bible? Yes. Basically, we're going to uncover a true narrative for the Genesis story, the creation story. One of them start in chapter uh, one until uh, chapter two, verses five, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And the other one starts right after until chapter three. And we're gonna more or less um, show the differences and the meaning behind them and, and to show actually two very different tradition to the same creation story that were brought together. But first, we're going to continue with day four. Um, as you recall, the previous day, we talked about the fact that God was battling uh, the water or the sky, the water. He was, it was making uh, uh, the water being dry so the land will be uncovered. That's the, that's the root of the Hebrew word for the word land. It's meant to be dry. And you could see the theme uh, up until now, uh, we created the kingdom. We have the kingdom of the sky, we have the kingdom of the space, we have the kingdom of the earth, and the following days are going to be talking about what's going to populate them. So, day four speaks about, actually, you know, the, the heavenly body, which is uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, and they are the creation that's going to be populated uh, the first day. We will talk about the fact that they are mentioned as big illuminating objects, but they are not called by name. They are not being called sun and they are not being called moon. And there is a reason to that. The main reason is uh, that just like the fact that, uh, you know, uh, we were very careful not to name the gods of the sea and gods of the skies. We do not want to name uh, the god of the sun and the god of the moon, who were very powerful deity worship throughout Mesopotamia, especially the moon god, uh, Narasin. And this is an important point that many modern readers will not pick up on, because the names of the sun and moon have no holy significance to us now. But it's important to note that at one time, at least within English and many other Indo-European languages, they did. I can think of analogs in Old Norse, for example, Sul and Mani, were the names of gods of the, the sun and moon. They weren't simply bright objects in the sky. They were conceived of as, as figures, divine figures. And simply to give their name was to have some polytheistic overtone when speaking about these figures. So the, apparently the framers of Genesis wanted to avoid these overtones, and it's why they very deliberately chose not to use the names of these objects. They gave them somewhat neutral terminology that suggested their function. They referred to them as lights. The words that they use are or and ma'ochuth, meaning light and a kind of a luminary, as it's, it's often translated, a light bearer or lamp. Somewhat of a technical term. It means essentially something that is holding a light. Yes. Uh, I suppose fixing it in place as it were. And yes. this is continuing what I see as a very beautiful image of the creator in, in Judaism as a kind of a divine engineer. And as we're going to discuss a little bit further as we go on, the figure of God in Judaism is, is very distinct from the Babylonian gods that preceded him and the the Greek and Roman and other European gods that sort of existed somewhat after or, or alongside him. Yeah. The creator, um, the creator in Judaism seems to have had a plan from the very beginning and, and is setting it forth so that the reader can follow it along uh, very clearly in Genesis. Yes. Um, just a little heads up to those who are interested. Uh, Yareach is moon in Hebrew, 
um, you will see this name again as the name of Avram Fathers. It's called Terach. Um, and the place they are heading from is Haran, which also has a lot to do with the whole uh, emphasize to the moon god uh, rituals. So just keep it in mind in case you will get to that in the future episode. And Shemesh or Samsu is like uh, uh, the sun god. Uh, and those names are absent in this uh, particular part. And again, this may not be apparent to you if you're reading it in translation, but if you read it in Hebrew, that absence is, is very palpable. You can't help but feel it as you, as you go through the narrative and realize, hey, they are very clearly, deliberately not using the names of these very important names of the sun and moon. And obviously there's a reason why. But let's, let's actually dig in. Let's, let's read uh, these, these verses and go forward. So verse 114 says in the New International Version, And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And going forward in 15, it says, and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. And again, I find the language in, in the original Hebrew of this to be very beautiful and, and somewhat interesting. The terms used are ma'achuth, and it says that there will be uh, otot, mu'adim, yamim, shanim, which emphasize the idea of uh, getting sort of like uh, clock measurements, uh, signs, uh, um, a way to divine the years, a way to divide the days, a way to divine the holidays. So they are very in control. Uh, what, what I'm trying to say is like... Uh, whatever is going to be created from day four onward supposed to control the setting in which it was created. So those two things are in control, but they are not gods. And this is a very important like part to emphasize, especially to whoever is being introduced to this new fate. Yes. Uh, Judaism, in its sort of uh, infancy of, of setting out its creation story here, is showing that it accounts for the functions of all of the preceding polytheistic gods and, and faith traditions that, that existed before it, but it's assigning them all to the primary god and clearly showing that this god is more powerful and in fact all-powerful and more all-seeing, that this god has more foreknowledge than the preceding gods. And I love these verses in particular because it shows the god of Judaism as essentially, again, as I said in the previous episode, a kind of a divine engineer, a clockmaker, as it were, a very elegant one. This figure, Elohim, is setting forth a beautifully designed universe that is continuing to unfold and is becoming more complex. And God, particularly in these verses, is setting forth the concept of time and shaping time so as to give it form and reason. And that time is obviously what gives us as human beings much of our meaning in life it is what allows us to coordinate and cooperate and anticipate and as we've not said to have holy days and you know even in, in secular terms to have holidays and and arrange for the things that we want to do throughout the year and so i find it really beautiful and, and kind of fun how the genesis narrative accounts for these things so let's go forward starting with line 16 God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And that's, we're ending there at verse 19 for the moment. So, uh, let's talk about that, Lidnot. Um... I want you to emphasize um, what you read. In Hebrew, we use the verb or the noun memshala, memshel, which means to govern, to rule. And govern is always comes in the idea of mortal kings. So once again, we put the sky and the moon as a very powerful creation, but they are still like uh, lesser than God. They are in charge of the kingdom of the light and the dark. In Hebrew, it's emphasized that the sun is the big uh, 
is the big maor is the big illuminating object while the moon is the smaller one and the and the star sort of like the helper and those are the objects or the things that will help us to separate the day and the night i'd like to point out that i discussed the the exact wording of this with Livnat and thought that it was very cool and, and very evocative and beautiful because in other mythologies like say greek mythology the gods of the sky and the underworld and the the seas for example have their own sort of dominion um but it's it's somewhat rarer i find that uh the sun and moon are described as having dominion which suggests a kind of a kingdom and i think this is kind of cool that it's as if they have their their own sort of little sphere or, or realm that they govern and i just thought it was very beautiful language to describe these beautiful fixtures in our in our skies um, especially in Fasson, uh, where we have King David or other king uh, look up at the sky and they see and, and they see the whole creation by night and it looks like the whole kingdom in the sky. So we, even in the old days, those sites left a lot of impressions on those who view them. So it's easy to imagine how ancient peoples could have looked to the night skies and seen a kind of a parallel to to their kingdoms on earth to, to see how numerous the skies were and to imagine that there was some other kingdom perhaps looking back or looking down upon them it is kind of yes. a beautiful image again uh, and if we already mentioned Abraham um, when God wanted to promise to him that he will have uh, he will have many offsprings he will make him look at the sky at night and to, sh to see the entire entire sky being illuminated by the stars. So it definitely left a lot of impressions in the old days. I'd like to make one more point about this creation of the light and the, the firmament, as it were, in, uh, in Judaism by making another parallel with Greek mythology. Greek mythology existed... It's largely parallel with Judaism in the sense that it was a Mediterranean faith and it was very ancient. And what I find distinctive about the two is that, again, in Judaism, with the figure of Elohim, you have a God who is very clearly setting out an orderly universe from the very beginning. He has a design and a plan in mind, and the world simply reflects his intention. Whereas in Greek mythology, the world seems to arrive, at least according to Hesiod and most traditional accounts that we can find, the world seems to essentially emanate from chaos and then to be given some order and shape by the gods after much of the, the mass and material of the world have simply sort of randomly come into existence. And I find the two philosophies about the creation very fascinating because I can see something compelling about both. I think from a modern perspective, there's something relatable in each of the ideas, but I do think that the creation story in Judaism, as it's exemplified in Genesis, is, is radically different than anything that we see in the area at its time, whether in, in the Babylonian faiths or the Greek faith or whatever else. Uh, and that's what I find to be so fascinating about it. So let's go yes. forward and talk about the fifth day, which perhaps is one of the more interesting ones. And I'd like to point out as we go forward, Take note about the, the actual length of verses as we go forward. And if you look at it, if you take a Bible and look at it, even visually, the days are getting more and more complex as time goes on. More is happening. There's more movement, more motion. And I don't think that that's an accident. I think that, once again, the, the Hebrew writers of this beautiful text were very well aware of what they were doing. And they're demonstrating, even in their writing, the growing complexity of the world and of Elohim's creation. Definitely whoever uh, reads it um, in the original text will feel the speeding up process. It, it will feel like a real evolution process that I think would be very um, noticeable to have a read it uh, in the original um, text because of the verb and the words being used and the speed of things, the days are becoming uh, quicker, faster, there's not much delay about description anymore. All right, moving forward to the fifth day, we're starting with verse 20. It says, And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. 
So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, and said, Be fruitful, and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. So, again, we have a process in motion, and God is proceeding with this orderly creation, and we're beginning with the relatively small things, which, again, I would point out, has a kind of a fascinating parallel in our modern understanding of how life began and continued to expand. Uh, it has parallels with evolutionary theory, which generally began with smaller things and became more complex. What, what significance does this day have uh, in Judaism today, leave not, and, and historically? Well, historically, I think um, it's more of the idea that like uh, that God created the great uh, Teninim, the alligator Tenin, uh, is a sea monster, uh, very powerful, very fearsome, to show that like this creation was made to prosper, but at the same time, God is above it. And once again, we are thrown back to Tiamat and. Uh, the idea that God is overpowering everything and he wills it. God wills the creation, so they we there. And the idea that even though there are many, they are still lesser in creation. Because they, they came before. They were not the emphasis of the creation. They were there to decorate the scene, so to speak. Like, uh, I, I, I will bring this example because this will be the greatest example I could think about. I once uh, heard a podcast of animators uh, about the games and they explained how uh, they first created uh, the the world and then another animator comes and create the building and then another animator comes and create like uh, the object that will be within it before they put the NPCs inside. So it, it's kind of remind me of that where like uh, the, the birds and everything is sort of like a decoration for the biggest thing, for the, the, the things that the most important thing in creation, which will be uh, humankind. That is yet to come, exactly. Yes. It, it, does, it does seem as though it's almost a, a play that is being staged, and the stage is being set, uh, exactly. and, and many of the smaller parts are, you know, are there on, on stage, but the, the main actors haven't taken it yet. Uh, uh, what I wanted to say is, like, um, they did get, they did get um, a multiply... Um, blessing which means they're supposed to take over but only where there's not mankind because you we will see later that mankind will be controlling of them but on areas that mankind are not there they are in control and it's a constant struggles between finding like the the place of the animals and the mankind we see it even in nature because uh the trees and you know, all the trees and all the things in the land were also created by claiming another territory. So it's very, in a way, it's kind of bring us back to another creation where like something else have to be destroyed for something else to be built on it. So uh, the, the land had to uh, dry the, the ocean and the trees needed to control the land. And now we have animals that will control the environment. That is a very fascinating so point a and something that I had never really considered. And I'm really glad that you pointed it out that clearly, uh, according to this passage, the, the birds and other minor animals have their own sort of domain and God blesses them too. I think that's a very beautiful note I, I, that I think a lot of people don't stop to consider that uh, they have their own blessing, uh, that they are sacred in some way before God and Judaism. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Even uh, even to go as far as to say that until like uh, the sins of uh, the generation of Noah and the Ark, uh, man was forbidden to kill and eat animals until that point. And then like after um, the generation of Noah are sinful, and God needs to destroy the world and recreate it. Only then, like, there's a blessing to, to eat animals. So the, the, there's a kind of struggle there about, like, power and, and feeding and needing one another. But at the same time, knowing that, like, uh, in order to be united is the, is the atmosphere creation. Then when there's balance. 
I'd like to take a moment, you know, get into the weeds a second and talk about the actual imagery used here, some of the original language, the, the Hebrew of these verses. One thing that I really like is this image of uh, the great sea creatures moving through the waters. I just think it's it's very beautiful and compelling. Uh, it it really reminds me of readings that I've done about the beginnings of life and, you know, the, the actual early creatures of the sea and how strange they were. And it, it was as if they were in evolutionary terms, searching for an ideal form that didn't yet exist. And we we eventually arrived at things resembling crocodiles and sharks and, and modern fish and things like that. But it took quite some time to get there. And there's some very strange forms that apparently populated our early seas before that happened. And so I find it just very, very amazing that the authors of Genesis intuited that the sea was the the birthplace of life. And that it was the sea that gave shape to life. It's just very fascinating to me. Uh, from an ancient perspective, what the sea must have meant to the peoples of that time for them to have intuited these things. It's just very fascinating to me. But let's talk about, again, the actual wording of this. Uh, let's talk about Shechetz. Shechetz Nefesh. And Hof. And uh, mm -hmm. Uh What do these words mean uh, in Hebrew, Lebanon? Sheretz is, uh, well, in modern Hebrew, it's kind of parasite, or, but it definitely in the old, uh, in the old age, it means like um, something that like is is many, is like uh, uh, being populated very quickly, very fast, because it it's been um, put inside a content and overfilling it by its own DNA and, and overtaking it. Uh, so we have the smaller animals that like are going to be populated very very fast uh, like the fish uh, like any other um, small small animal I, I'm thinking about frogs I'm thinking about uh, a lot of uh, snakes I'm thinking about uh, bugs they find in themselves uh, and and Chaya like life God emphasized the fact that these things have some sort of a soul some sort of uh, a meaning, a point. And then we have Remus and other creatures of the lands that are, you know, populating, being uh, scorpion snakes, all of those things. So according to the BDB, uh, Shechetz and its, its root verb uh, have an association with uh, creeping. There are Aramaic and Ethiopic parallels that suggest creeping, swarming, like you said, something numerous. And the uh, Remes, by the way, there's a discrepancy apparently in modern Hebrew and classical Hebrew where the the scene uh, letter in that word is pronounced somewhat differently. So Livnat and I have a field day discussing these things sometimes. Remes. Uh, yes. Yes. We fight it's, and about it's very it funny. a lot. Uh, but, uh, but this <laughs> verb uh, has to do with, as she said, creeping and essentially gliding. And so to me, that suggests something larger. And again, a, a kind of a growth in, in life, as it were, at this time. Yes. Yes, and off is uh, probably every creature that is connected to avian creatures, even though like in modern Hebrew we are very associated with birds that can fly, usually you know smaller birds. Uh, but I think it could have mean something even greater. I, I, to be honest, when I read that part in Hebrew, I, I think about the dinosaurs. I mean, it, it does feel like it. It feels like a great creature that probably extinct long ago. Off, by the way, has more modern connotation of chicken or other singing birds, like something like that. But back in the days, it has a completely different meaning. I guess that's why they emphasize uh, Yofif, which has the verb which means to fly. Uh, so not only avian creature, but creature who could fly. Again, probably very, very uh, big, uh, because then we have the great alligators. They emphasize the fact that they are great as well. So we have a struggles of uh, mammals. If you think about the whole Egyptian god, kind of, kind of a whole fight between uh, creatures that you know want to take over each and every territory. So, and the god himself had uh, the image of the animals. So I'd like to uh, emphasize once again that the creation of the Taninim 
the the great reptiles, the, mm-hmm. the sea monsters, the sea dragons, as it may be glossed, it is very special here. Uh, it says, uh, Elohim mm-hmm. where again, we're using that special verb, the verb vacha, meaning divine creation, where God, Elohim, is, is creating these things essentially out of nothingness. He's simply willing them into existence. He didn't shape the great reptiles. He, he willed them into existence. He created them divinely. And the other thing that I'd point out about this is that it doesn't simply say Taninim. It says Hat Taninim, the sea dragons, the sea creatures. The other life in this passage does not get that treatment. Uh, it simply says Shechetz. You know, crawling things. Yes. The, excuse me, swarming things. Rof, meaning the, the flying things. They are not prefixed with the ha, which in Hebrew means the, in much the same way that perhaps Leviathan or Behemoth may get later. Am I correct in that, Libnot? Yes. Yes, 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 exactly. I think mostly because they want to say the name, but they don't want to say the name. Again, we, we are talking about the fact of de- deity, and we don't want to name them, so we kind of want to say, hey, you remember those God? Yeah, yeah, God made them too. Um, they're very powerful. Of, even though like it's in a singular, it's regarding to the entire uh, kind of the avians, creatures. Same for Sheretz and, and same for uh, Remes. But in this case, it's very much so, in the plural, uh, which suggests that, that greatness. There's something that Hebrew does yes. oftentimes to suggest grandiosity yes it's a group it's a pact it's like each and every kind of them are very are multipliers and are big and god even like said keep keep producing so to say so produce and fill up the water with your kind and fill up the sky with your kind and fill up like the earth with your kind so god creating the setting just once again uh emphasizing that the the framers of Genesis were very well aware that their audience would know who Tiamat and other aquatic deities were, and they needed to account for them without directly giving them name and without directly giving them any power in the narrative. But they do have a kind of a special place, but they also wanted to make it very clear that God created them, and he didn't simply shape them out of the, the, the existing world. He did so in this kind of a spectacular divine way. So they are an important part yeah. of the plan, but they are very much under God's control. They, they are his creations. They're very explicit about that. Yes. Okay, so let's go forward to the sixth day. Yes. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. So that is uh, verses 124 through 125, where we are talking about uh, the essentially what seemed to be mammals. Mm-hmm. Certain mammals were probably more in consideration here in uh, the, the minds of the framers, animals that were important to the early Jewish people. Uh, could you talk about those animals or not? Well, um, the creature of the farm were very important in, in, in Mesopotamia. I mean, the trade was done uh, by them. You know, if something was very good, you know, it'd be worth a cow. Lesser thing would be considered a sheep. So even the laws actually regarding to that. I mean, even if, if a thief was caught uh, with a sheep, like his punishment would be lesser than a thief who was caught with a cow because it means he was uh, very used to it, uh, very like uh, very known in the art of it. Um, that is a funny concept, you know, a known uh, cow thief. Yeah, basically, yeah, because it's a it's a big it's a big creature. Like if if you you know risk yourself being caught by taking that, it means you're you got to be pretty skilled to doing, steal a cow know? right out from someone's nose, you know. Exactly. Yeah, and I mean you know you, you could basically buy someone for you know dairy creature, you know. I'll take this woman for two camels and one sheep, please. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, basically, yeah, um, they were very important. And that's why they were emphasized. Because, once again, those are creatures that are very close to mankind. Because the sixth day 
is all about the finalize of the creation. Now we actually talk about uh, the man. And in order to do that, we have to reach to closer circle of the man. So we are talking about the creature that are in direct contact with the man, that they are much uh, easier to control to men, um, that are very sacred and important to men because, you know, those creatures are being sacrificed on altars, so they have to be more important than the other creatures that were created until... Right, they they have ritual significance, uh, sacred significance. Let me quickly point out that in verse 22, the phrase that is translated oftentimes as be fruitful, that's kind of a traditional phrase in English, so the specific verb they use is uh, paru, and it literally means to bear fruit. It's it's from a, a root having to do with actual fruit. It, there's nothing figurative about it. And so uh, I just think it's neat that, again, we have this idea of spreading, of the birth that nature produces in both in both plants and animals, this concept of spreading, germinating, this this early world, essentially, that is being created and set forth in Genesis is kind of a biologist's dream in many ways. And it, it has, in my mind, a lot to do with, with our modern concepts of, of zoology and botany. And it's kind of fascinating. So let's discuss the actual wording of this in Hebrew. Uh, in verse 24, it says, What yot mech Elohim, totzecha achetz nefesh chaya leminach, bahimach wachemeth, wachaythu echetz leminach wahi chen. Uh, again, we've we've given the the new international version translation of this, but what I want to point out again that may not be totally apparent to someone reading this in English is that God does not create the animals of the earth, the the behemah, uh, in the same way that He created the uh, taninim. Uh, he does not bacha uh, them, so to speak. He doesn't He doesn't create them divinely. He has the earth produce them. It's more of a, a natural process. Uh, yeah, and and so, Lenat, can you talk about that and and also uh, the word behemah itself? Yes, I, I want to I want to compare twenty four to twenty. Uh, in both of them, God says uh, once to the water and once to the land. First of all, He said to the water, the water let it say produce the living, and now He said to the earth, take out the living, so to say. So you have ishertsu, and then you have totse. So you could compare those two because both of them God directly speaks to to the both sources of life, the the earth and and the sea. Very um, very early thinking about where life coming from. So once the the sea created life, now the earth creating life. Uh, so we creating the bema. So those are the cattle, uh, goats, sheep, cows. Uh, you are probably very familiar with the word behemot. Uh, just keep in mind that behemot is actually the plural word of the word behema. Behema could also mean uh, the entire kind of that creature, just just as much the sherets, even though it's a singular, it means the group. So every kind, every remes. Um, if we uh, take the meaning, we have uh, everything that has to do with the cattle everything that has to do with the farm, everything that has to do with uh, the meadow. So basically they are mammals, but their creation is lesser. Uh, God does not say vaivra, uh, divine creation as, as, as with the Taninim. It's lesser and it's important because they are not the emphasis of this chapter. Uh, I could think about it just like uh, there's an Egyptian goddesses that has a cow head. So if, if you think that we're going to praise those animals because those animals are using rituals and they're sacred and they're holy, just keep in mind that they're not important because they're, they're just another decoration before the greatest creation, which is the mankind. That's my take on it, basically. Yes, and just to, again to note out that if you're familiar with, with behemoth and that kind of a phenomenon where oftentimes in Hebrew, grammatical plural doesn't necessarily suggest a literal plural, uh, as in the case of the later biblical behemoth. It's not many beasts, it's one, but it's it's a, a magnified one. That... Just uh, like uh, later on in Genesis, when we speak, when we awfully speak about the Nephilim, uh, which is, again is a plural, <laughs> 
uh, the singularizing feel. Um, again, just the idea, something very powerful, very meaningful. So let's move forward to, you know, what is the pretty obvious uh, heart yes. of the matter to the creation yes. of man. Uh, so beginning with verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So, let's discuss this. This is obviously some very heavy, yes. <laughs> heavy material. Yes. Um, it becomes apparent at this point that God has reserved a place for mankind and has essentially created this world as a sort of a seat or domain for him or, or them, uh, we should say. There's some really fascinating stuff here. Let's begin with uh, one of the most hotly contested issues where it says, let us make yes. man in our yes. image and our likeness. Yes. First of all, yes. not, let's talk about why it says our image and our likeness and why God created man in his image to begin with. Yes. Um, what I want to say is, is, you probably know, a lot of uh, Jewish scholars had a lot of issue with ours. As one, <laughs> something that you may or may not know, uh, Judaism has a very problematic conception of seeing God as plural. Because the moment you think about him as plural, or being able to divide himself, or being able to be more than one, uh, he stopped being God the way we treated him. God is, is a soul being, he's one of a kind, he's everything. And he's a single entity that cannot be uh, feeling the way we do. He cannot uh, move the way we do. We are, he's bound by very different laws. It's one of the most theological uh, struggle Judaism has with Christianity, by the way. So if, if ever you're wondering why Judaism has a problem with the idea of Jesus being uh, a man, and a God at the same time, that's that's one of the problems. And this is a very fascinating early struggle in Judaism about how to define God. Because as Livnot says, it's apparent to anyone who has studied Judaism that Judaism uh, sees a monotheistic creator, a single creator, but it also sees competing gods. And so you have the concept of monolatrism, where one God is seen as supreme but that doesn't necessarily mean that other gods or lesser powers don't exist. You also have the issue in trying to define God as singular and alone that the ancient Israelites were very well aware that at one point uh, Elohim, or as he was earlier known, El, was part of a pantheon. He, he was grouped in with other gods. He was a storm god, and he came to have special significance for the early Jewish people who saw him as increasingly a single figure, a lone figure, who was solely responsible for the creation. But they had vague memories that at one time he was not, and that there were other practices associated with him. There was there was human sacrifice, and, and these are echoes of things that we'll see later in Genesis with the, the sacrifice of, of Isaac and things like this, uh, the would-be sacrifice. Elohim, or as he was earlier known, El, was a, a figure that underwent a great deal of evolution uh, in terms of how he was perceived in early Judaism. And Genesis is a really fascinating example of how he is going to be framed going forward as this more supreme figure. And some scholars believe that the plural is an echo of that awareness that at one time he was part of a greater or larger divine pantheon but there's also an alternative explanation for it of course yes. with not uh, before i go to the alternative explanation let me give you another another way to look at things if any one of you played the game plan escape torment there's a there's a group of mice called many as one and the thing is that there there are like a group of a lot of Creature, little creature bonding together, but they have just one mind, just one thought, but there's still a lot of them. But the idea is that, that they are together, so they are creating just one emphasis of thinking. 
uh, there's a way to look at God like that, you know. But again, it goes against every Judaism perspective and thoughts. So the suggestion are so, uh, when God said, let us do, it's, it's the use of a king. It's a kingly speak. Okay, like a king before he, he speaks, he, he talks in uh, in plural way. It's it's a very somewhat like the the royal plural in English. Yes, and and it's it's considered very high high way to speak in Hebrew as well. Nase, uh, like it's 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 important. It's uh, it's it, it gives the word some kind of a gravity, some kind of a power. Uh, so there's that. Another way to think about it, and this doesn't exactly contradict, but still has a, an issue by itself, uh, is the idea that God did had a subject. He did had the angels. So those will be a few ways to look at things that, like God, consult with the angels, as as you see Him consulting in in the Book of Job, for example, that He brings the entire angel with the devil. Uh, this will give an idea why we have the devil appearing in chapter 3. Uh, well, it's not exactly the devil, but you know, um, the Talmud letter emphasized him as being like a, a creature, a very strange fact that this creature was able to coexist. I like to think about it as a royal way of speaking, or he consulting himself in a way, some kind of being aware and looking at this creation, maybe like uh, when someone talking to himself in a way, you know, like any one of us could speak to ourselves before considering something. So it could be it. Yes. Uh, the, the idea that God was speaking to a kind of a divine retinue to, to his angels, the, the messengers and servants, is fascinating to me on two levels because it's definitely plausible. Uh, but I would also point out that uh, they weren't yet named, at least at this point in Genesis. And that's kind of fascinating. Certainly, I think the, the writers could have had them in mind. Uh, and, and you know, a, a reader of the time may have had the angels in mind. But uh, I wonder how likely it is, considering that they weren't named, and that Genesis so far is so meticulous, especially the first chapter of Genesis is so meticulous about its structure and the system that it's setting forth. Yeah, uh- just um, if if you have any idea in mind of what this image coming to say, I mean, you should look at Michelangelo uh, image where you see God and a lot of you know people around him reach out his hand to to the man who is naked and is alone. This could be like the idea of what's going on that like God has a few thoughts or pattern. With it. It's it's very mystical. I mean, it's a way to look at it. Let's let's talk about the the image. Uh... Let's yes. talk about the actual wording used here. What What is the actual wording used in, in the Hebrew in Genesis to talk about the image of God? He said, he said, Selem, Selem, Dmut, uh, mean like uh, some kind of a part, some kind of a, uh, likeness. And if you say you create man to look like God, does it mean that God actually has a body? Does God have some kind of a shadow? Does God have some kind of a structure? And again, this goes against every Judaism perspective of God. So, one few scholars suggest that the idea is like to create something that will rule others or create things, because mankind will later on gain the ability to create and multiply and control and do things and be their own. Uh, their own creation to the point that they want to actually challenge God in the whole Babylonian uh, uh, Babel um, chapter um, before the generation of Noah. Let's point something out too. Uh, let's focus on the wording here with uh, with Selim. Yes. Uh, in its original form, in its origins, it means more or less liter- literally, apparently, to to cut off, to to craft, uh, more or less by hand. It has a, a an Arabic parallel. So. Let's look at the reality here. We, we have to face facts and recognize that the way that the, the framers of Genesis were thinking about this was deriving from earlier concepts about deity. When, when deities were carved out of wood or stone or whatever material, uh, when, when deities were personified by physical objects, but they're starting to move past it. So what's fascinating here is that the same terminology is being used. You still have words that suggest cutting and crafting and carving uh, in their origins, but they're starting to be framed here 
in Genesis in, as Lignot points out, a more mystical way. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear to a critical reader that the authors were not conceiving of God as having been literally crafted or carved in any way, but there's still some linguistic echo of, of older practices as they talk about these things. It's almost as if they can't help but, but think about it in these yes. terms because these practices have existed in the Middle East at that time yes. for so long that it shapes the way that people think about it and speak about it. And they will actually once again come to be seen in the whole Avramic uh, passages where, you know, there's the idols and, and so on. And this is also made clear in, in uh, the uh, the uh, the verb dama uh, to, to be like, yeah, tamut, yes. uh, which literally had connotations of an image, effigy, or likeness, uh, where we again have echoes of more pagan practices, but these things are refined, made more mystical, more abstract and remote, almost platonic, as opposed to typically Babylonian, uh, which is which is continually developed through the the, the Talmud and rabbinic scholars. Um, and their idea of what exactly constitutes the image of yes. God. Uh, with not, is, is it not the case that in rabbinic theology, it, it's very clear that, that God has no form and yes. no shape, and so it's more an idea as opposed to yes. an image? Um, it, it's, it's a very... It's like a very concept. Like, you take, um, you take an artistic idea of something and put it, like, inside a very limited tool or, or frame. So, uh, like, when an artist, when he tried to, like, uh, draw, like, when he tried to paint the sky, he, he can't really paint the sky, okay? He just paints some kind of a fragment of it. So it, it could be seen like sort of like this idea in mind, even though uh, it's still problematic, in, especially in, in later Talmudic uh, and Rabbinic uh, thoughts, because God has no shape or form. So That's a really remarkable way to have, have uh, phrased it. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, although we use the, the, the Tselem and, and uh, the Muth, the verb used is, again, Bacha. Elohim et ha Adam, yes. so that it's very clear that man is a more divine creation, and although he was given a shape, given an image, he was done so in very divine terms. He was not shaped; he was willed yes. into existence with an existing shape, which again, to me, is more of a Platonic yes. idea. Um, so that they're 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 taking existing nomenclature words that may have been used and almost certainly were used for older polytheistic gods and they're using it for this continually developing monotheistic yes. concept ma ma mankind mankind is also the only creature that are described as being male and female like uh, god emphasized uh, that he created them as male and as female uh, it's the only creature that given such uh, emphasis in this first um, creation story, men and women are equals. They are created together. It, it could explain later on, uh, because uh, uh, it, it's very important to emphasize here, because we will soon see uh, that we're going to have a problem with the second chapter, which we'll reach it later. Uh, but in this particular creation... Let me point out with that briefly. I'm, I don't mean to interrupt you, if not, but... Uh, let me point out again to uh, take note that at almost every point so far when God has completed a task, he has examined it and declared that it was good. Uh, what are we missing here after the creation of humankind? <laughs> and we don't have it. Ain't it ain't good. We don't have it. God, God, we don't have any emphasis of God looking at it and saying it was good because, uh, well, we don't always good. We are not always good. We're not sure the jury is out yeah. on mankind, yeah. essentially. But, you know, when when God will zoom out, or so to say, will will do a zoom out and look at the entire creation, he, he, he will look at things and say it was very good. Yes, let's, let's go forward with that. So going forward, beginning with verse 29. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. 
and it was so. So only then do we have it declared in verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Again, this very orderly rollout of, of creation. There was evening and morning, the, the evening and morning of, of Jewish thought that delineates the day. We have the ending of the sixth day declared, and as you are probably well aware at this point, we are nearing the ending of the Jewish week, and we're approaching the day yes. of rest. And this is a fascinating cutoff point, because I was not aware of this, but apparently, from what Livnot has told me, uh, the traditional chapter division that we know of, where the, the day of rest, the Sabbath or, or Shabbat, is shown in the second chapter is somewhat of a, a, a Christian mm -hmm. influence. Could you talk yes. about that, Lidnot? Um If you could check his name, uh, there is a there was a priest who divided the chapter, uh, a Christian priest, and uh, his theological thinking was uh, to remove the Shabbat, the the sacred day to the next chapter and to do some kind of a big cut off i i remember that like since i was a kid like it always bothered me why why this, the seventh day was not in the same chapter i mean it it makes sense it's it's it continued the, the temic thing i mean if if you look at uh, genesis chapter 2 uh, verses 4 we talk about something different completely so why this part was not included and apparently it was very intentional because, uh, as, as you all know, Christianity is a different religion. Uh, they don't believe in the Shabbat the same way the Judaism does. Um, they believe in Sunday, being like the holiest day. So in order to uh, lower the, the importance of the Shabbat, we have to cut it off from the rest of the day. That's why uh, Shabbat was actually pushed to the next chapter, completely losing the idea that God uh, ending his task. And, and, and so everyone needs to respect that day as much as God respect that day. Um, so just so you know, um, thematically, uh, the Shabbat is part of chapter one. But in our current uh, way where the Bible is being divided right now, it's actually been separated. And it is intentional. So I was not familiar with this figure. Stephen Langton, who was apparently an English cardinal, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, who apparently more or less gave the Bible the traditional chapter divisions that we know today. Uh, and as they've not told me, uh, this was not necessarily uh, in accord with, with uh, ancient Jewish ones, which has uh, led to a lot of debate yes. and, and uh, in, in some modern circles. Yes. In, in Judaism... Um, this particular part, chapter 2, 1 until 4, is actually used as a prayer in the Shabbat, in the Kiddush, uh, which is like uh, the evening uh, dinner of the Friday with all the family. Which means uh, the sky and the earth and all the army of all, uh, it's really beautiful, like the, the God is like presented as some kind of a very big military kingdom, so everything stopped. At this day, um, even God, you know, stopped in this day. Um, God bless the the seventh day. God uh, make make it holy, um, because this is the day where He He stopped working. Uh, Shabbat, uh, Shev, Shabbat, which means stop working. Uh, it has some kind of a prayer, prayer uh, Mesopotamian uh, kind of day, holy day, which called Sabato. Um, which was done according to the moon cycle every seven or uh, every few seven days or, or so. Uh, so it's definitely a, a borrowed idea, but at the same time, it's very new. Uh, the concept of actually stopping to work and actually resting. Uh, if you look at a lot of uh, later, um, even Roman, uh, you know, uh, writing, you would see them looking at the 
at the Hebrew people and calling them lazy because they actually take in a day to rest. So the concept of actually, you know, to lay back and rest was considered and un- un- was unthoughtful at that time. As, so, as, as you know, yeah. funny as it may seem, you know, in modern eyes, we should all probably be very grateful that uh, that precedent was set and continues to be uh, a practice in modern society because, you know, working continuously throughout the week would probably drive people nuts. I mean, even now with a, a five-day work week, people are often overworked and overloaded uh, mentally, if, if not physically. So the ancient uh, framers of Genesis displayed very great wisdom in this as they did in just about all things. So, yes, uh, the, obviously the seventh day had this kind of a, a sacrosanct status in early Judaism, and, and it was clearly uh, a very early idea that arose out of earlier uh, Mesopotamian practices to some extent, but was made more holy and more central in Judaism, as, as many uh, practices and customs were, as, as we've seen and noted. Yes. Um, before before we, we close uh, this uh, episode, I do want to go briefly because I think we kind of, you know, kind of gone over all the things. So I, I do want to go very, very briefly on what's coming next. Basically, we have from verse 4 until uh, the end of the chapter, um, another creation myth. Uh, just instead of uh, instead of it being perfect, emphasized, parted into categories and everything in order, like it's it still seemed very, uh, very old fashioned. Even like kind of kind of the way it was written, untouched. Well, the first chapter seems like a, a very um, a very heavy editor hand had their had their like mess in it. Um, the second chapter, the second Genesis creation story, reads much more like a Mesopotamian myth. It's yes. it's very clearly more of a myth or fairy tale than yes. than the first chapter was. Yes, um, God creates us from the dust, makes it a very secondary creation. We are we are more like an an afterthought. Like we have the word, and the word needs to be taken care of. So we we are created. And we have the whole idea of, of, of man being actually just another part of the animals. Uh, if you recall uh, the myth of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, Enkidu was a beast of a man. He was actually sleeping with the animals. He was being one with them until he's been civilized. And the same thing happens here when, when the man here, he noticed that he's alone. And God says, well, it's, it's not good for the man to be alone. So he, he created uh, Eve. Um, and this is a very beautiful um, line. Ezer Kenegdo, which means helping against him. Uh, <laughs> so one would ask, uh, <laughs> what? Against what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's two explanations. Either like a, a helping uh, figure that coming from another direction, like... Uh, like the man actually meet meet her. That's why a lot of people think that uh, this man was actually two creature just sep- like uh, glued together on their back. So God kind of separated them and made them face each other. Another, which is kind of what I like to think about, Ezer, if if she's good, if they're good to each other, they're helping. Kenegdo, which means if they're not good to each other, they'll be against each other. And um, there's the whole myth about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the man actually leaves everything he has to uh, his mother, his father, to be glued once again with with his wife. And, to be made whole. Yeah, in a because sense. also it's, it's very important uh, to emphasize that although the woman is kind of an afterthought, she, she, she's not... Like um, a, a very, um, I heard a lot of people saying that she's a limb or a rib or something. Uh, there's the use of the word tsela. Um Tsela in modern Hebrew does mean rib, like a rib cage, just below, uh, uh, just around like uh, the upper body. But in 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 ancient word, it could actually means a lot of other things. It could actually mean a whole entire body. 
like they were again glued together or they were actually two people like a siamic twins or something so it's very hard to know what exactly going on that's why this myth sounds very uh very ancient very fairy tale like um, right uh, so and- and once again, just just to finish this off really quickly, uh, once again we see another problem uh, with the divide of the chapter because uh, uh, part uh, verse sorry uh, twenty five mentioned them being naked, which once again does not uh, relate to this particular part. It relates to the parts coming forward, which we'll we'll right. not discuss right now. But this is more or less to show two different. Uh, myths of creation coming together and the idea of what men's are in this world. So going forward in the next episode of the podcast, we're going to have a lot to talk about because we're going to be covering chapter two and the second creation narrative of Genesis, which in some ways is more fascinating and more controversial than the first. In fact, in just about all ways, it's more controversial. A lot to discuss there. I'd like to to, uh, make one more little kind of a, a footnote to cap off this episode. I want to go back and and restate that in the eyes of Elohim, uh, we as mankind were apparently not good uh, when we were first created. When he first uh, when when he first looked upon us, it was only in verse thirty one of chapter one of Genesis that he saw the totality of creation and our place in it, and saw all that he had made and that it was very good. Uh, and uh, as Livnot has pointed out to me. This will obviously prove to be significant in chapter two, where the problems of mankind will become more evident. I'm sure you know a lot of the the general details of this thing, uh, whether you have actually read the Bible or not. It's just kind of part of our common cultural heritage <laughs> yes. in the West, especially. But it, this the like problematic a- nature of man and the fall of man is a really hugely interesting story that influenced the likes of Dante and Milton and 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 even mythologies that we may not immediately recognize, like Norse mythology. There's a huge amount of Christian influence in Norse mythology, which, as you'll remember, came later and had a lot of contact with Christianity uh, in the Middle Ages, and in the, in the early and later Middle Ages. So there's uh, a lot to unpack in our next episode, and you don't want to miss it here on On the Waters. Uh, we're going to be saying goodbye for this week. We're going to be wishing you well. I'm Jordan. And I'm Liv Not. And we, uh, we hope you enjoyed. Hope you're having a great one. And we're going to catch you next time with the second chapter of Genesis here on On the Waters. Laters. Laters.